It's time for the Revival Now podcast with James Brandt right here on the Luke 418 radio network. Get ready to receive a word from the Holy Spirit. Get ready to experience revival. First Samuel 16, I'm going to read verses 6 through 13 to kick this off. This is a right now word from the Holy Spirit for the body of Christ, for Living Waters Chapel, for the body of Christ as a whole. All right, so here we go. So it was when they came that he, the prophet Samuel, looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man, as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Underline that. So Jesse called uh, Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet a youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him. Isn't that something? The dad left out the youngest. That's a mistake right there for all you younger siblings, right? Come on now. (laughs) That feel left out, right? For we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was a ruddy, now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him. For he is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now, as I read this account this week, I, I, these questions came in. I wondered this. How many times... Have we made a decision? How many times have we made a judgment call about an individual or about a situation based on outward appearance? How many divine appointments have we turned away because deception, the deception of the outward appearance of a person or a situation? By the way, my message is entitled this, Deception of Outward Appearance. Deception of Outward Appearance. How many times have we shunned people that, listen to this, that held the key to our breakthrough because their outward appearance or social status was not up to our carnal, our fleshly or worldly standards? See, here's what the Holy Spirit just showed me. He said, there is so much carnality, there's so much flesh in worldliness in the body of Christ that's crept into the body of Christ. And that, and because of that, there is a confusion that hinders many, listen, from hearing and being led by the Holy Spirit. And then we wonder why all of these terrible consequences happen. Why are leaders falling? Why are things going on? Why are people backsliding? And, and so we got to be led by the Holy Spirit, not by outward appearance. Amen? The account I just read in 1 Samuel 16 should be a wake-up call. A wake-up call for all of us. A spiritual wake-up call to understand that even the most anointed, listen to me, even the, the anointed and powerful prophet Samuel, he missed it because he was basing it on outward appearance. The prophet Samuel! Come on, somebody! Samuel's flesh got in the way of selecting God's choice for a king, David. Amen? God, listen to this. Now, you got to understand this. 
Samuel did not select David as king. God did. Are you understanding me? Listen to this. Samuel was just giving voice to it and anointing David with oil. All right. So God didn't say to Samuel, you go ahead and pick someone. He goes, no, have them all come before you and I will show you. Thank God it wasn't the prophet Samuel that picked it because he would have picked the oldest one and he wasn't called or anointed to be king. Are you getting it? So you got to understand this. We simply need to hear from God and be obedient. Seeing the heart, seeing the heart of a person really means this, that you are in tune and hearing from the Holy Spirit. That's what that means. We need to go beyond the outward appearance. My point is this, looking at the the heart of a person is not always going to be obvious. Are you following me? Oh, it's, it's quiet in here today. It's quiet in here. Listen to me. Let me say it again. Looking at the heart, the heart of a person, it's not always going to be an obvious outward sign. We need to be spiritually in tune with the Holy Spirit so we don't miss what God wants to reveal to us. God is going to use people in this last move of God. Come on. That is that might not be up to our standards. So here we go. David was judged by others. David was judged by others that he was not able to face and kill Goliath. Look at 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17 verse 26 here. I'm talking about the deception of the outward appearance. God doesn't look at the out. He's looking at the heart. Amen. First Samuel 17, 26 through 33. I want to take a look at. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and, and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard uh, when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. It's interesting that Eliab was the one that, that Samuel chose. And then God said, Nope, he's not the one. So that same brother's jealous of David here. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom did you... Uh, And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? In other words, hey, little boy, go back and tend your sheep. You're not the one to face Goliath. Oh, come on, somebody. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down here to see the battle. And David said, what have I I done now? Is there not a cause? Underline that. Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now, when the words which David, uh, David spoke were, were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth a, and he a man of war from his youth. So, again, David's oldest brother, Eliab, totally misjudged this situation and said, David, you're just doing this because you have pride in your heart. Have you ever done that before where you wanted to conquer something and someone said, oh, you're just doing it just to be seen. You're just doing it for pride in your heart. Have you ever been misjudged because of that? See, he was saying that pride was motivating David to go fight with uh, Goliath, which was absolutely wrong and obviously was not the motivation of David's heart. I want you to notice that this account with David and Goliath happened after David was anointed with oil and king. Come on. He wasn't king yet, but he was anointed to be king next, right? And it said the Holy Spirit came upon him after the prophet Samuel anointed him. So David's brother and, and, and all those other ones, they were jealous of him. Say jealous. jealous. Now, so you got to remember, you always remember this. When the Holy Spirit is upon you, you will complete, uh, upon you to complete a mission. The outward circumstances do not matter. Amen. And it doesn't matter what other people say. You go and get the job done if the Holy Ghost is leading. Amen? 
If you will simply obey the Holy Spirit and cooperate with Him, you will be victorious if you don't give up. So never back down when the Holy Ghost gives you an assignment. Amen? It would have been so easy for David to say, Oh, you know what? Yeah, okay, then I'm just going to back off. Go ahead. You guys do it. No, but there was a motivation. There was something in David that said, I need to go after this thing. I need to take this thing down. The one that is defying the true and living God. Amen? Amen? So, here it is. I want you to notice, when David saw that nobody was willing to go and fight Goliath, David said the words that should be seared in our hearts. He said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? David was in a spiritual mindset and knew that this fight with Goliath was absolutely justified. Amen? Because Goliath was coming against the true and living God, and he had to take action. He's like, hey, no one else is going to do it. I'm going to do it then. Someone's got to stand up for the Lord in this matter. Amen? Here's what you need to know. Are you ready for this? There are some things worth fighting for. Oh, come on, somebody. There are some things we're fighting for, especially things that are misrepresenting our heavenly father and the kingdom of God on this earth. Amen. Amen. You got to understand this. God is a God of justice. If you are led by the Holy Spirit, he will motivate you to stand up against injustice and unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. You see, give me an example. I'll give you an example. President Trump fighting these people. That are coming against him unjustly. Are you hearing me? What? I mean, how does a man that that is being come against so much. How can someone take so much and still hang in there and want to fight? I'll tell you why. He's got a mission from the Holy Ghost. Are you following me? I don't care if you're a Trump hater or not. That man is going to bring this country back and get rid of what this other one has done. Amen? Amen? Whose side are you on anyways? Amen. I'll be honest. I don't know who can be, if you can be a Democrat and a Christian. I don't believe you can. Because the absolute, the, the, the status of the Democrat party, the platform is for murdering the unborn. Literally. You can literally read something in the Bible and you can take the opposite of it and say, that's what the Democrats are for. Well, I didn't come here to hear politics. Too bad. You know what? Here's the deal. Politics are important because it affects every area of our life. Someone needs to say it. Amen? So David was ready to go to battle to defend God and his kingdom. If there is no motivation to defend the kingdom of God and stand on God's word, listen to this, you are stuck in a carnal, fleshly, and worldly mindset. 100%. Oh, I seen when I when I brought up Trump, some of y'all want to climb, go right under the seat, like, oh, it's just gonna oh. relax, calm down. But someone has to say it. That is total injustice coming against that man. Listen to this: he was the biggest friend in the White House that Christians ever had in the history of this country. If if you're a Christian and against that, you got to check your heart. Hello, somebody. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Of course, Living Waters Chapel's not endorsing him. But I can say, personally, James Brandt, personally, I am voting for President Trump. Amen? Hallelujah. Galatians 6. Hallelujah. Come on. What's some foolishness going on in our country? What's some absolute foolishness? All right. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Some things are worth fighting for. Fair elections is one of them. Hello. Oh, we're hitting some major areas here today, aren't we? No more election interference. Come on. No more election interference in the swing states. Come on. If you really think that was a fair election in 2020, you are blind as a bat. All right. All right. I'm going to carry on. I'm going to carry on. Well, we can have this talk some other time. Okay. 
I think you kind of feel my heart on this whole situation, right? Okay, I think we're good. Go to Galatians 6, 1 through 3. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such in one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing he deceives himself now here's the deal listen to this if we are going to be in tune with the holy spirit and look beyond the outward appearance we must maintain a spiritual mindset say spiritual mindset i want you to notice the instruction to restore a person can only be accomplished you will only be able to restore someone If you're spiritual, what does that mean? That don't mean just in actions. That means a spiritual mindset right here. It means you're willing to look beyond the outward and look at the inward. It means that you're listening to the Holy Ghost. It means you're putting the word of God at the center of your life. So in other words, like the opposite of a spiritual mindset is someone that is, uh, you know, that's jealous. They're selfish, right? All right. A spiritual person is looking out for others. Listen to this. I said this before. Let me break it down again. The word restore in that verse in the Greek is the same word used to set a broken bone back in place. And to, or it also means this to mend broken fishing nets. Isn't that interesting? The English uh, definition of the word restore means this to bring back to a uh, to bring back to a former condition or to reinstate or to repair something so listen to this so this passage is talking about restoring or to helping listen a backslidden christian emotionally and spiritually heal and get them back to a place where they once were in god are you following me To get them back in place in their God-given purpose and calling. That's what this verse is talking about. All right? How do I know that? Because you cannot restore an unbeliever. They never were in that place. Are you right? They were never in that place to begin with. So obviously restoring a person means someone who once was close with God, operating in their full potential and calling. They fallen away from that we are helped to restore them back into that place are you getting it i want you to notice that this passage in galatians 6 comes immediately after galatians 5 can you believe that isn't that interesting wow some revelation there my point is this that restoring someone back to their original place comes after talking about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit So again, so this is not talking about an unsaved person. It means it's it's talking about a backslidden Christian, someone who is not operating in their God-given potential or calling. They've fallen away. It's interesting that the Holy Spirit had to give us instructions on restoring a backslidden Christian. Listen, isn't that kind of sad when you think about it? He literally had to give us instructions on how to help restore someone. And the Holy Spirit spoke this to me when I was writing this message. Listen to this. He said, I had to put that instruction in the Word of God because many Christians, listen to me, are dealing with backslidden Christians without love and it causes them to never come back and get restored in their God-given purpose in the body of Christ. And because of them never getting restored to that proper place, many people will not be reached with the gospel and go to hell and let the lake of fire for eternity. Simply because they're not flowing in the gifts and calling on their life. So this goes well beyond, are you hearing me? This goes well beyond just that person. It's all the people they would reach if they were in their calling and ministering to people. Right? See, see, that's the spiritual mindset. But the body of Christ, we're, we're selfish. It's all about me. It's all about me. No, it's not. A spiritual Christian looks and says, other people are being affected by you not flowing in your calling. 
A spiritual mindset looks at the bigger picture. A carnal mindset blocks your spiritual vision and hinders your spiritual senses from operating properly. So, we are to restore and minister to a backslidden Christian. It says this. Here's the instructions. Are you ready? God had to tell us this. Why? Because anytime He gives us an exhortation or a command, He knows there's a weakness to do the opposite thing. I mean, if this just operated normally, He wouldn't have to command it. Does that make sense? We, listen to this, we are to restore and minister to a backslidden Christian in a spirit of gentleness. You know what that means? You know what that means? It means to be kind, to be tender, and I like this one, to be mild-mannered. Oh, listen to that. Kind, tender, or mild-mannered. The Holy Spirit had to remind us of that because of, again, that fleshly desire, that, that fleshly tendency is to do this, is to be harsh and beat the person over the head with the word of God. Ugh. I know the word says it's a hammer, but that's a little much, people. I, I don't think that's what God had in mind. You getting it? And then it goes on to say this. Listen, he had to be, we had to be reminded of this. Are you ready? It says this, to consider yourself, lest you also be tempted at the same thing they fell for. And then it goes on to say, to bear one another's burdens. To bear one another's burdens. Why? Why did God have to tell us that? Because I don't want to bear someone else's burdens. I got enough of my own. Yeah. <laughs> right? We're all in this together. So this is, God is trying, the word of God, when you read it, it, it's, it's, this is God's thoughts. He's trying to bring us back to a spiritual mindset. So we see things not in the flesh, not with our carnal flesh, not with our selfishness, but how he wants us to see it. You getting it? So a Christian with a spiritual mindset will always put themselves, listen to this, in another person's shoes and walk in compassion like Jesus did. Always, I, listen, I'll challenge you, before you open your trap and say anything to someone, a, a backslidden Christian, someone, all right, an unsaved person, number one, I want you to promise me you'll do something. You'll first put yourself in that person's shoes. Why? Because there is a humility connected with it. What if I was in their shoes? How would I act? Boy, this person's going through a real hard time. Boy, I'd probably be a little messed up too if I was trying to do it without the Lord. Hello, somebody. Amen. So that is the mind of Christ. Humility, love, compassion, kindness, uh, tender, mild-mannered. So listen to this. The Holy Spirit brought this up to me. and I, It kind of got snuck in here. I'm like, you really want me to put in? Yeah, do it. Listen to this. God may even test your spiritual vision by sending you an angel. We are entertaining angels unaware. You want to know what that is? That is a test of the emergency broadcast system. God may send an angel into your path that is someone you wouldn't give the time of day to. And you just shrug them off. But God's testing you. Wow. So be careful how you are treating people. The, you know, be careful. Um, <laughs> we got to lift the standard higher. Amen? Amen. Now, Ministering to the unsaved and to the backslidden, uh, we must be somewhat. You got to understand this: if you're going to be spiritually minded, then and you need to look, you need to go beyond that outward appearance and look deeper in. Listen to this: we need to be somewhat blinded to the outward appearance of a person. We need to be blinded to the outward appearance. Okay, we need to look and consider the heart issues. Again, I'll say it again: of what they've dealt with in their life. I'm telling you, I, you know, here's the deal. The, the older I get, the more mature I get in Christ. I, I start to consider more, especially after all the stuff I've been through in my life and some of the dumb things I've done after hurts and wounds, right? You get more mature and you, you stop and think, wow, you know, I kind of, I understand. I understand a person who went through that, how they could go a little wacky for a short time. 
Right? I can understand. You know, someone maybe who, who's dealt with a lot of death or something, and, and they're, they get caught up in addiction or something. <laughs> they're trying to numb pain. Let, let's stop... Let's stop coming against the fruit and let's try to think deeper and, and, and ask yourself, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? How many times have we passed judgment with maybe a young girl or, or a woman that was dressed inappropriately, right? I mean, in, instead of having, um, instead of having compassion for them and realizing that there really is an issue of why they're doing what they're doing. Maybe they dealt with a lot of rejection in their life. Maybe they had daddy issues in their life. I mean, this is real stuff, right? This is why Jesus was so effective in ministering to people. Because he didn't let that outward appearance get in the way. And guess what? We are ambassadors for Christ. We represent Jesus. So I think we should, if we're representing Jesus and not ourselves, if we're representing Jesus, we probably should do what he would do in that situation. Amen? Amen. See, we don't know all the personal details that led up to why a person are, why they are the way they are. But something happened in their life. I promise you this. They, people just don't do something for no reason. Are you following me? Look at your own life before you got saved. The mess you were in. There's a reason why you did what you did in sin. So I'm telling you right now, we need to be sensitive to that. That doesn't mean you're putting your stamp of approval on sin. Amen. Listen, someone you minister to someone who's maybe in homosexuality or something. A lot of Christians have this mindset. They think, or, or maybe a trans or something. They have this mind that mindset. They say, well, if I'm nice to this person, that means I'm accepting their sin. No, you're not. No. It means that you're spiritually mature enough to look beyond the outward and you're, you're looking at the heart and saying, this person needs the Lord. I mean, come on. Think about before you got saved. I mean, that would be, I mean... You, you'd still appear and blush. You'd, I'm, come on, somebody, right? The dumb things that we've did, right? So we got to be mature enough. Now, that doesn't mean if you're nice to someone who's into something bad, it doesn't mean you're accepting the sin. You've got to get that in your head. You've got to get that in the head. If that was the case, Jesus wouldn't have ate with sinners. So we as Christians are not called to condemn people, but to help them heal and restore them and get them born again, right? The backslidden and the unsaved, the two separate categories there. Now, so if we as Christians turn our backs on on a person that's lost in bondage or a person that's backslidden, listen to me, there might not be another chance for that person to come to the truth. So we need to take advantage of each opportunity uh, and take advantage of it. Be a blessing in that situation. That's why I felt this was a right now word because it's so easy with our everyday life. We get caught up in our fleshly carnal mindsets and the Holy Ghost is saying, slow down. You are on this earth to reach people, to love them, to, to bring healing to them. Amen. Especially an unbeliever. Listen to this. They may never read a physical Bible, but they're reading you. Think about that. You are the... Really, think about it. An unbeliever? They're most likely not going to pick up a Bible and read it. Right? But they're reading you. They're reading me. Think about that. Now, go to John 8. I want to show you something here. John 8. You getting anything out of this? Spiritual maturity means you're going to look beyond the outward appearance. You can handle it. You can handle it, people. Amen? Just remember where you came from. John 8, 3 through 11 here, I want to take a look at. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. One minister brought this up recently and said, how, how did a religious person catch her doing that? They staking out and watching this stuff going on? What? That's messed up to begin with, right? Caught in the very act. Huh? 
You get what I'm saying, right? Listen, perverts, listen. Uh, <laughs> John, John 8, 5, listen. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accurse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one. I love that. Beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman, standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, who are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, I went a little, went over, but I, I felt like I needed to. But the Pharisees, the religious people, were the ones that wanted this lady stoned and killed. You get that? They're the ones that wanted her stoned and killed, the one that was caught in adultery. Whatever Jesus wrote on the ground with his finger, whatever it was, it convicted the conscience of those accusers. Isn't that? What did he write? Was he writing out their sins? What was going on there, right? Jesus was calling the accusers out, listen, for operating without love and compassion toward this woman. See, you've got to understand something here. Jesus operated at a totally different level than the religious people. And they always questioned Jesus. That's why they judged him. Think about that. He operated, listen, in a spiritual level, not a fleshly level. Now, you need to understand. Uh, you've got to catch this. Ready? You need to understand that Jesus was not approving the sinful uh, actions of that woman because he told her, he said, go and sin what? No more. Jesus still laid down the law, right? He didn't say, go ahead, woman, you can leave. Go ahead, continue what you were doing. Sorry they bothered you. No, No. He said, go and sin no more. But he had compassion on this woman and saw beyond the sinful actions. And you know what Jesus saw? He saw a broken person that needed love to shift the tide in her heart. That's what he need, that's what he saw. And these religious people, people that were caught up in this dead religion, they were coming against Jesus said no she should be dead. Jesus said no 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 you don't understand. I didn't come to kill people. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus was looking beyond that outward appearance of the situation. And he saw, again, that broken, that flawed human being that needed to be loved and to have another chance. So we need to represent Jesus accurately and well in everything we think, say, and do. Because again, we are ambassadors for Christ. That's a big word. Ambassadors mean you represent him. You represent him. You don't represent yourself. Listen, listen, Eric. You in the big picture, you don't even represent Living Waters Chapel. You re- represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to this. The moment people find out that you call yourself a Christian, you represent Jesus Himself. I know some people try to say, "Oh, don't look at me. I'm not Jesus." Listen, that's just the way it is. You call yourself a Christian, you are looked at like the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you treat people bad, they think Jesus is connected to it. Are you getting it? Sorry, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. And you know the enemy is going to take advantage of that. There's nothing more that the enemy wants is to drag the name of Jesus through the mud. And that happens every time that we get caught up in a carnal, fleshly mindset. Amen? 
We can't do it. We must be the voice. We must be the hands. We must be the feet of Jesus Christ on this earth. That's when you're going to see a move of God. That's when you're going to see a revival. Amen? Amen. We must be led by the Holy Spirit. We must maintain a spiritual mindset to have the mind of Christ present in our life. Now, um, in, in the, that, in, and how do you know if you're in that mindset? Because that's how it's going to affect how you deal with the broken and sinful humanity. Now, if we only reach out to those that look acceptable and meet our fleshly expectations, we are missing out on the will of God. We are totally missing out on the will of God. We are called to love the unlovable. We are called to pick up those that are down. Amen? How many times have we pushed away divine appointments that God was trying to send our way to lead an individual to Him? Listen, it's a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake by judging people by their outward appearance. This is what we have to get across. Now, real quick, go to Matthew 7. Show some love. Show love to everyone you're around. Amen? I'm telling you, it will cause their heart to be softened. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. Matthew seven fifteen through 20. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. This passage, all right, this passage is not saying to stay away from people that are in sin. Some people think that. This passage is talking about protecting ourselves from people that have the wrong motives and a heart that's disconnected from God. Are you getting it? There's a difference there. It's talking about, uh, it's talking about keeping the wrong people. Are you ready for this? Keeping the wrong people out of your inner circle. Say inner circle. It, he's not telling us don't minister to people that are, that are caught up in evil. No, he said just don't let them in your inner circle. Cause if you let them in the inner circle, it's gonna negatively affect you. So Jesus did say, that we need to be fruit inspectors. But that only has to do with who you're letting in to the inner circle of your life. Does, all, does everyone get that? Because yes. that's very important. All right? Now, I want to give you some examples as I get ready to close here in about uh, 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> I got a lot, of say, a lot to say today. Uh, go to Matthew 13. Let's talk about some examples where people were judged by their outward appearance. And people missed out on blessings because of it. Matthew thirteen fifty three, And I want to look through verse uh, 58 here. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these, and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, um, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were, underline it, they were offended in him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except, say except, in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief, because of their offense. People disregarded the Lord Jesus Christ himself because of his outward appearance and outward circumstances. They judged him because of his earthly family, the city that he grew up in, and even because of his looks. Isaiah 53 talks about, yeah, he didn't dress, he didn't come as a king, he didn't look like a king, right? He didn't dress like a king would, would dress. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I think that's been answered pretty well, don't you? People were offended by him and stumbled over his natural circumstances and situation. He was born in a barn. He was born in a barn. 
Would a king, the king of all the, the whole universe, come from a barn? Oh, I love, I love God's wisdom, don't you? I love it. Their offense toward Jesus even hindered the power of God, the anointing from operating through Jesus to them. They hindered their own blessing because of their offense toward him. He, it says that he did not do many mighty works because of their unbelief or because they were offended in him. It literally, that offense limited Jesus's ministry. Listen to this. Whoever you honor, the anointing you honor is the anointing you're going to partake from in your life. The anointing you dishonor, you shut the valve off. You won't be blessed by it. Here's another one. Timothy. Timothy was judged by his age as a pastor um, instead of the condition of his heart and being called by God. Paul exhorted Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12 to let no one despise his youth as a pastor. But to be an example, I can't use that one anymore. I'm 46. I used to use that when I pastored at 27. Can't do it anymore. <laughs> Wish I could. I crossed the line, I guess, on that one. <laughs> Let no one despise his youth as, as, youth as a pastor. But to be an example to the believers, listen, be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. But people who are offended by his age, they hindered the ble- being blessed by Timothy's ministry, even though the Holy Ghost was all over that kid. Come on, somebody. Amen? Listen to this. Who else was judged by their outward appearance? The sick and the diseased were judged by their outward appearance. Look at Matthew chapter 8 real quick here. Matthew chapter 8. Don't you dare stop at that outward appearance. Go and look at the heart of a person. Look beyond... Amen? Matthew 8, 1 through 3. When he had come down, when Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Now, you've got to understand something here. People that had leprosy back in the day, they were absolute social outcasts. They had their own place. They're like, oh, you have leprosy? Go, no, you, you go out here. We don't want anything to do with you. The rejection was crazy. It was horrible. All right? They were shunned by people. They were shunned even by religious people. They were considered worthless. Can you imagine that? Listen, the world is cruel. Have you figured that out yet? Listen, I'll say this. The world and dead religion are cruel. Amen? But can you imagine how emotionally beat down these people must have felt that had this leprosy? They were judged by their outward appearance. But then the master Jesus comes along to show them love and mercy and how valuable they were to him. Jesus literally, come on, touched them. He touched. Can you imagine? I know it doesn't sound like much when it's being preached, but you got to get to in the mindset of these people that were rejected. In, in, in the, can you imagine that? Just to feel the touch of Jesus upon their head. Wow. It, that love and acceptance. These are the people we should be reaching out to, the lepers in our society. Amen. So if you're going to represent Jesus Christ accurately, you must give your attention, compassion, and show love. You need to show love to the sick, to the diseased, to the hurting people, the people that are on their deathbeds. Come on and pray for healing starting off. Amen? Go to Luke chapter 7. Here's another one. Someone who is judged by their outward appearance. A woman that was a prostitute was judged by her outward appearance and her motives toward worshiping Jesus and anointing him with oil. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through... Uh, you'll find out. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. She was actually a prostitute. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. 
And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair and her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, (laughs) would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Duh, you don't think Jesus didn't know this, right? And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, Well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to him whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Again, it was the religious people that were condemning this woman and her motives. This woman's heart, this woman's actions were absolutely pure and holy toward Jesus. Jesus pointed out that she was forgiven much, and so she loved him much. Amen? See, that's why the Word of God says to be thankful. Because it keeps you remembering how much you were forgiven by. Be very careful not to conge- uh, uh, be very careful to condemn a person for their past mistakes and their past identity. We need to have a spiritual, we really need to have a prophetic mindset that can see through the mess of their past and see the person's true potential. Amen? Amen. Have you ever been wrongly judged for something? Has anybody ever brought up your past mistakes? Has anybody? I think we all have. Man, I mean, they just throw it at you. Man, they beat you with that past. And in your heart, you're saying, well, I'm a different person. That, well, that's not me anymore. Stop it. Amen? Amen. I hate it, it's it's not fun to be to have that. It's hurtful and it feels absolutely unfair. Because it is. That's not who you are anymore. Amen? Amen. You know you're not that person any longer, but it seems to follow you wherever you go. Listen, here's what it is. If that's you, listen, the enemy is trying to keep you down. Stop falling into the trap of the enemy and just keep moving forward. Amen. Keep moving forward. And it really comes down to this. I'm on the last page. Listen to this. It really comes down to this. God knows the present truth and He knows the motive of your heart, who you are now. As long as you have peace between you and God, you're good. You're good. Amen. Say, I'm good. Say, God knows my heart. God knows I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm good. Hallelujah. And this is the last point. I'm not going to open the the word about it, but just real quick, I wanted to mention this at the tail end. In Genesis 13, Lot and Abram, they were living by each other and things were getting a little too crowded, right? And they said, we need to separate ourselves. One needs to go one way, you need to go the other way. So they had a choice of where to go, okay? And so the Word of God tells us that Lot chose the plain of Jordan because it was, follow this, pleasant to the eyes, It was pleasant to the eyes. In other words, the outward appearance looked real good. But listen to this. The Holy Ghost said, He did not seek me for direction where to go. And it led him and his family to settle in the city. Are you ready? You want to know where Lot settled? Sodom. And we all know what happened to Sodom, don't we? 
We all know the fruit and the end of that city. But Lot chose that area because it was good to his physical eyes. And it eventually destroyed. It brought havoc to his family. Listen, someone needs to hear this today, right now. And Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt. Remember that? The angel said, get out of this city. It's going to be destroyed. And don't look back. As the wife was leaving, she ignored God's command through that angel. And she looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. That evil city had a negative influence on Lot and his entire family. And all because of this, Lot was led by his flesh and he kept God out of the equation. Always seek God for direction and wisdom before you make a move on anything like that. Church, this message was a warning from the Holy Spirit to not judge people or situations by outward appearance. We must seek God for revelation and wisdom and maintain a spiritual mindset. We must look beyond that outward appearance. That is the only way, listen to me, that's the only way we're going to truly advance the kingdom of God and minister the love of God effectively to every person we come in contact with. We must have the mission and mindset of loving, leading, and restoring mankind back to their God-given purpose in Christ. Amen? We must look beyond, listen, the deception of the outward appearance. Let's stand up in this place. Thanks for listening to the Revival Now podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and download the Luke 418 Radio Network app at Luke418Radio.com. I'll be back next week for another anointed and life-changing Revival Now podcast.